the 17th and 18th century was an extremely prosperous place, much admired overseas. England was becoming richer and more open and tolerant as a society. And the religious changes that were happening at that time benefited more than just Christianity. In fact, I come here to find the oldest synagogue in England. Just behind Fenchurch Street Station in the city is the place that marked the return of the Jews to London. In 1290, King Edward I had expelled all Jewish people in the name of Christianity. They weren't to live openly here again for another 400 years. And this is exactly the London street they came back to. Tucked away in the side streets of the city of London is where it all began. This plaque marks the site of the first prayer house established for Jewish people in London on Cree Church Lane in 1657. The prayer house is now gone, but a short walk from here is the building which replaced it and which stands as a wonderful tribute to the new tolerance of the age. By now, England was a parliamentary democracy and the Puritans were in charge. As a Puritan, Oliver Cromwell felt some affinity with the Jews. He could identify with their religious struggles, and they were, of course, the people of the Old Testament. So Cromwell invited them back to England, just as Catholic Europe was trying to get them out. A lot of Jews lived in Spain and Portugal, Sephardic Jews, but they found the oppression of the Spanish Inquisition well nigh intolerable and duly fled to Holland and to Amsterdam, a much more tolerant place. Well, London was becoming more tolerant too, and for the Jews, this was a great time to come here. Through this iron gate, the newly arrived Spanish and Portuguese Jews commissioned the building of a magnificent place of worship for their growing community at the turn of the new century. The Synagogue of Bevis Marx. The amazing thing about this building is that from the outside, it looks almost exactly like one of the many dozens of city churches that Christopher Wren was building in London at this time. Simple buildings with stone mouldings and stock brick construction. The simplicity of the building, of course, reflecting the priorities of the Jewish faith, rather like Protestantism. The only thing that signals that this is in fact a synagogue is the inscription in Hebrew over the doorway. By now, the monarchy had been restored. One of the conditions of the restoration imposed by Parliament was religious tolerance. Charles II agreed. The Jewish population was thriving. To tell me more about the fascinating history of this synagogue, I'm going to meet up with Morris Bitten, the shamash, or curator, of Bevis Marx. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Morris. Hi, Very nice to see you. Thank you. Thanks. I mean, this is a, a most ex unexpected building to find in the centre of London, isn't it? A tiny little courtyard, very much hidden from the street. Is this the original arrangement? Yes, absolutely, and this was deliberate because um, when the permission was given to build a synagogue, there were certain conditions because they weren't really sure about Jews at the time. Right. And one of the conditions was that it was not visible from the street. Oh, I see. So that's why we're tucked away down here. Yeah. There were other conditions too. I mean, one of them was that we couldn't be in the centre of the city, for example. It had to be as near to the edge of the city as possible. You couldn't get any further out of the city because where the gates are now, is where the old city wall was. Right. And beyond that, the next street is actually today called Houndsditch. Yes. And the reason for that is because it's where they threw their dead dogs. Oh, it was charming. A ditch around the city. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a good area. <laughs> this was where the Jews settled, actually, essentially, around the synagogue yes. itself. As you know, this, the first Jews to, to, uh, to, to come here were the Sephardi Jews in the resettlement. And um, it wasn't very long before the word went out through the rest of Europe that it was now safe for Jews to live here again. Mm. So they started to arrive in numbers from the rest of Europe. The only Jews in England were here, so they all came here. Well, after all that, I can't wait to go inside. Should we, should we go on in? Excellent. Let's go. Now, before we go any further, yes. we've got something yes, for me. Before you go in, if you don't mind, just yeah, I'll pull that off. Yeah. There we are. Very good. Let's go. It's a terrific space, isn't it? Beautiful, authentic, early 18th century interior. This could almost be a Wren building. Is there any, any reason to think that Wren was seriously involved? Well, yes, it's interesting you say that because there are two schools of thought. Some people believe that Wren definitely was involved. I happen to be one of them. 
and, and other people believe that he, he wasn't, that possibly they were... Well, there's no doubt that the workmen, the artisans, were people ha who had worked with Wren, but whether it was under his... Authority. Or, or, yeah, yeah. or, or whether they were just moonlighting or, or a copy <laughs> is, uh, is, is open to debate. I mean, you mentioned earlier the clear glass window. Obviously, we know that that's typical of Wren, but in addition to that, they needed light in here because in a Jewish service you need to be able to read Hebrew. You can't participate in a service unless you can actually see what, what is being read. In a sense, the first thing, talking about light, that strikes you about this absolutely wonderful interior are these spectacular candelabra mm. that hang down very low. I mean, we're standing under an enormous one, um, which looks as though it weighs a ton. It does weigh a ton, <laughs> literally. <laughs> And how is it supported? I mean, the, the um, Well, there's an interesting story about this chandelier. It's um, a gift from the Amsterdam congregation. It was uh, when, when they heard that um, the, the new congregation in London was about to open a new synagogue here, they sent one of their chandeliers over as a gift to mark the opening of the new synagogue. Interestingly, it's supported in the loft of the synagogue by an oak beam. This was donated by Queen Anne. It was apparently from one of the warships of the period and she sent the beams to the synagogue to hold up the chandeliers. I'm very glad to hear it, standing underneath it. It's, it's good, it does look as <laughs> so I wouldn't worry, you've got very good insurance. <laughs> but Queen Anne, well, Queen Anne was therefore very sympathetic towards the, the community. She was. And, and, and the monarchy in general in the late 17th century? Um, I mean, was that true earlier? Um, yes. These early settlers were very wealthy people. Mm. There were some very, very wealthy merchants that came to London in the early 18th century. And, uh, they donated huge sums of money to the congregation. And doubtless at the, at the back of Cromwell's mind there was the thought that, that, that accommodating the Jews was, was not unrelated entirely to their mercantile well, wealth. I personally believe that's the reason there are some that believe that because he was a Puritan, yeah. Puritans have this strong affiliation to the Old Testament, yes. that he allowed the, the people of the Old Testament to come back to London, uh, to England. But, Personally, I think it's a commercial thing. Um, That's what you call enlightened self-interest, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> There's one thing at this end of the synagogue, though, that looks to me typically English, but only by the criteria of, of Wren churches, which mm. is to say it looks at first sight like a sort of altarpiece with yeah. urns and mm. scrolls and Corinthian columns and gilding and elaborate carving. There are actually Wren churches in the city that have altarpieces almost identical to that. Well, I was going to say. Yeah. I think this must be one of the most impressive pieces of Baroque woodwork in London. I love it because it's got green columns and it's painted with marble and all the rest of it. It's very splendid. How, how does it actually function? Well, it's, this is the, the focal point of any synagogue, the Ark. It's the, the cupboard which houses the scrolls of the Torah the five books of Moses, the center of Judaism. And this is where the Torah scrolls are taken from and taken up to the reading desk to be read. Mm -hmm. And you've got uh, up there in Hebrew inscriptions. Yes. Um, this is the Ten Commandments, the, the first two words of each commandment in Hebrew. So very succinct, yes. Yes. But no images here. Well, no. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> not. We, are, we, are, we take the Ten Commandments literally I shall not bow before any graven image, any image of any type. So we don't have any imagery in the synagogue at all. Like so many 17th and 18th century Protestant churches, this synagogue resonates with the spirit of the age. It speaks eloquently of the similarities between the two religions, both based on the word of God. We've come a long way since the beginning of this series. We followed the transformation of England from a feudal land of knights and barons to a capitalist nation of artisans and merchants, from servitude to freedom, from an age of faith to an age of reason, from Catholicism to Protestantism and religious tolerance. And we've seen how these momentous changes express themselves in the most wonderful way in religious art and architecture, from the Grand Norman Cathedral at Winchester to the delicate Wren buildings in the city. But our story doesn't stop here. In the next series of Divine Designs, I shall be continuing my historical exploration into how religious belief has inspired some of Britain's most breathtaking art and architecture.